Ladies and gentle soars, welcome to, or back to, Orbis Pagona, the Spec Evo seed world inhabited almost entirely by descendants of one progenitor species, the Central Bearded Dragon. You guys were overwhelmingly positive about the first episode. Like, seriously, not one negative comment. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. And for those of you waiting on the next Assessing Survival video, don't worry, I'm still working on it. My goal is to have it out by the second week of April at the latest. In the last episode, we left off at the end of the Vitacene, the short but very important period of time that will have a lasting effect on the future generations on the world of Little Beards. Before we zoom back into the planet's surface, I'd like to talk about the planet itself just a little more. I'm not going to cover every detail and metric of the planet, but we'll go over a few. Orbis Pagona is only 93% the size of Earth. This means that an animal that weighs 100 pounds or 45 kilograms on Earth would weigh 93 pounds or 42 kilograms on Orbis Pagona due to the difference in gravity. Which, further down the line, could mean that the inhabitants of the planet could grow a bit larger than even the biggest of animals on Earth. It lies relatively within the same position in the habitable zone to its own star as Earth does to the Sun, though not precisely. Orbis Pagona has one moon called Winston, named after my first bearded dragon. However, Orbis Pagona's moon is slightly larger and farther away than our moon. Winston also features a sub-moon or moonlet that orbits it, called Moharamit, which is named after the elementary school I went to. A full rotation on Orbis Pagona runs for about 26 hours as opposed to hour 24. Because the moon is much farther away, the tidal forces on the planet are much calmer, even more so because Orbis Pagona is mostly land rather than mostly water like on Earth. Though these things aren't too impactful on the project, I thought it might be a nice little addition. What's more impactful is the average temperature on the planet. Of course, temperatures will vary with climate and latitude, but the average surface temperature on Orbis Pagona is 83 degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees Celsius. In some places on the planet, during the height of summer, it can be as hot as 42 degrees Celsius. Nighttime and winter temperatures tend to not dip below 17 degrees Celsius, with the exception of the poles which experience temperatures as cold as 8 degrees Celsius. That's enough about statistics. Let's get back to the little dragons making their way in this new world. I left you guys off with this image of a much more green and lively Orpus Pagona at the end of the Vitacene. How did this happen? Well, it was poop. Before the reptiles began to take over the ecosystems, Orbis Pagona relied mostly on the terraformers, insects, and fish to fertilize her plants. When the dragons showed up, they too fertilized the soil. But because the bearded dragons populated the planet so fast, the plants didn't have enough time to reap the full benefits of this. At the end of the Vitacene, with less dragons eating plants, most of them eating each other, the plants had more time to grow and take advantage of all the dragon poop. Specifically, the poop of Pagona sandaris becomes crucial to spreading plant life. As their diet includes more fruit, their poop spreads the seeds of these plants far more than that of other dragons. Slowly, over the course of millions of years, the once semi-arid deserts and forests flourish into a variety of green ecosystems that cover most of the planet, including wetlands, rainforest, deciduous forest, estuaries, etc. More plants create more humidity, and more humidity creates more rain, which creates larger bodies of water. This explosion of life marks the beginning of the Phytonian period. This period is where the next couple of videos will take place. But enough about the plants, you came here for the lizards. Though semi-arid and desert ecosystems still exist, the explosion of plant life displaced billions of dragons that were adapted for drier ecosystems. So naturally, our little beardies must adapt to these changes. While Pagona Galabis continues to prey on younger bearded dragons, Pagona heterospiculum find itself struggling to stay relevant as a predator in its ecosystem. As the planet becomes more humid and bodies of water become far more common, the hybrid species finds itself searching for alternative food sources in ponds and lakes. This begins as the occasional shoreside snack like guppies and dragonflies, and slowly over time becomes entirely semi-aquatic predation. Introducing the Stagnosaurus pagonis, whose name means the bearded pond lizard, or just the pond lizard for short. Stagnosaurus is the first genus of a gamut on the planet to differentiate themselves from the Pagona genus. They are far better adapted for swimming than their forerunners, losing most of the spikes that bearded dragons are so famous for to reduce drag while swimming. The smaller spikes that run along their backs slowly over time formed into scoots, which are much more hydrodynamic. These scoots increase the surface area of their tails, allowing them to propel themselves through the water more efficiently. This same adaptation can be observed in reptiles like the caiman lizard, and of course crocodilians. If a semi-aquatic lizard's tail doesn't have scoots, it will at least be flat on the sides, like water monitors and even sea snakes. Their previously more rounded tails would not be sufficient for propulsion underwater. 
Most, if not all, reptiles swim in a horizontal swaying motion, including bearded dragons. Stagnosaurus swims in the same motion, with the addition of slightly webbed hands that allow them to make sharper turns while swimming. They can hold their breath for up to 30 minutes, which allows them to search for snails as well as pursue fish and aquatic insects for much longer. Their diet consists of the previously mentioned snails, fish, and insects, as well as seaweed and really any other item their ancestors ate, as they do occasionally still spend some time on land, either for finding food or basking. Having such a varied diet and more food options has allowed these animals to grow much larger, comparable to iguanas in size, reaching lengths of 90 to 120 centimeters, or 3.5 to 4 feet. However, they are not the apex predators of their ecosystem. Upon venturing into the waters of Orbis Pagona, the dragons encounter the first non-lizard animal to prey upon them, the Megamouth Bass. The Megamouth Bass is a descendant of the Smallmouth Bass, which the human terraformers seeded the planet with to keep smaller fish populations in check. The Megamouth Bass evolved in a fashion much similar to that of Pagona Galabis. Eating juveniles of their own species turned out to be a much better alternative to their current niche, becoming the apex predators of freshwater ecosystems. Megamouth Bass reach lengths of roughly 2 meters, or 6.5 feet long, and can swallow smallmouth bass and even young Stagnosaurus whole. However, adult Stagnosaurus are a little harder to gulp down, and can usually fight back by scratching and smacking them with their tail. So far, on Orbis Pagona, even the largest bodies of water are still freshwater. This will of course change over time as water erosion digs at the sodium deposits further into the planet's crust, but for the time being, the freshwater rivers and lakes are dominated by the Megamouth Bass. In terms of their interaction with other lizards, Stagnosaurus are solitary much like their relatives, and really only come together for the mating season. They retain their blackening beards and head-bobbing behavior, though said beards now lack spikes. Battles between males in and out of the water are common. Young Stagnosaurus will hide along the edges of bodies of water in the denser foliage much like juvenile crocodilians. While Stagnosaurus pioneered venturing into the water, this bearded dragon took the first step towards full herbivory. As a result of this plant life explosion, the bearded dragons of course had plenty to eat. But one bearded dragon encountered an issue. Everyone is eating these things down here. Some folks are eating these things up here, but no one is eating these things right here. So, this individual, who we'll call Doofus, decided to try his very best to reach these taller grasses and bushes. Doofus and his descendants also continued to try this, slowly getting larger and taller with generations. Do I have any type of science to back this up? A little bit. The idea is that over generations, the bearded dragons who can reach taller plants without having to climb have access to even more food with less energy expended acquiring it, whereas other bearded dragons have to leap or climb for taller plants. All these extra calories saved from not leaping or climbing result in a very steep increase in body mass. Over the course of roughly 2 to 3 million years, we see the emergence of Nuchosaurus eteosus, whose name means the true necked lizard. Nuchosaurus is much larger than its relatives, with a length of 5.5 to 6 feet, or roughly 1.7 meters, and a height of 3 feet or 90 centimeters at the top of its head, it can be compared in size to a large dog, weighing about 90 pounds or 40 kilograms. Nuchosaurus continues to inhabit semi-arid regions along with other bearded dragons, but often much closer to the tree lines where forests begin. They are entirely herbivorous, only occasionally eating insects opportunistically. They feed on mostly the leaves of taller bushes and low-hanging tree branches, but also eat spineless cactus pads, flowers, fruits, as well as grasses. They continue the trend of avoiding using too much energy. Unlike their relatives, Nuchosaurus do not fight each other, simply because doing so expends too much energy. Nuchosaurus live in large groups called buffets, typically anywhere between 5 and 20 individuals, but there is no limit to how large a Nuchosaurus buffet can be. Because they do not fight each other, when it comes to the mating season, males will instead be chosen for their size and the intensity of the orange displayed on their beards, making them the first of the beardies on the planet to lose the ability to darken their beards for intimidation. This same docile behavior means that they don't typically prey upon or show aggression towards other beardies. Even though they are more than large enough to swallow a basal beard or dragon whole, they typically don't. Young Nuchosaurus will often remain close to their nests, which are laid very close to the forest edge. Oftentimes doing so means ending up in the same buffet as their parents. The Nuchosaurus definitely don't take care of their young, but they're not bothered by them. An adult may step on a younger Nuchosaurus and kill it without batting an eye, as oftentimes juveniles will use the shadow of the adults as shade. These larger dragons have no natural predators, at least for now. This is because beta dragons have not yet evolved the means to prey upon vertebrates that are too large for them to swallow. 
So, in the next episode, we'll continue to see changes that take place during the Phytonian period, and perhaps begin to see substantial changes in how these dragons prey upon each other. Big thank you again to everyone who watched the last video. I do, I do have a lot of fun making up these animals. If you'd like to get involved with the community or the channel, join the Discord. Link is in the description below. Big thank you to our patrons, Reinfort14, Xavier Frank, SFM Heck, Mike Yost, Kevin Tyre, and Jastis, as well as our channel members, Sotcheck and Filthy Casual. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.